Did you know that the Gardener's Workshop offers cut flower seeds? Our hand-picked selection includes only the varieties we grow in our own fields and gardens, and each pack is printed with our exclusive growing tips and insights. So visit us at thegardenersworkshop.com today. The Gardener's Workshop, turning all thumbs green. Hey friends, welcome back to another Field and Garden Podcast. It is your friend, Lisa Mason Ziegler, and thanks so much for dropping in. I am really excited about today's topic. Um, I am joined again by my good friend, Dave Dowling. Hey, Dave. Hi, Lisa. How are you doing today? I am good, thank you, and I love talking about selling flowers because great, Dave and I both are on the same page. Great topic, great topic. It mm-hmm. is. I mean, there's no end to the possibilities mm-hmm. and the opportunities, and we're just going to kind of talk about and, some of that. And it's one of the most, it's just as important to sell them as it is to grow the flowers. Well, it's, I think it's kind of more important if you ask me. But yeah, because you can't, if you don't sell them, you can't keep growing them. Exactly, exactly. So before we jump in, friends, if you haven't um, connected with us over at thegardenersworkshop.com, I highly recommend we have fully stocked online library of flower farming school courses, as well as home gardening courses, flower business scaling courses, as well as an online garden shop and a ton of free resources for you to explore, as well as our sister podcast, Seed Talk, um, where Lane and I host that. And um, you're just invited to kind of dive in and have a little look around. Um, So today, Dave and I are going to talk about the different ways to sell your flowers. And Dave and I have sold a lot of flowers. We both kind of started, didn't we, at the same time, Dave? Yeah, about 98. 96, yeah. Okay, so you were a little ahead of me. Yep. So, and on that note, why don't you tell people who you are in case they haven't, you know, that one person that doesn't know who Dave Dowling is. <laughs> okay. Um, my name is Dave Dowling. I have a cut flower farm in Maryland, just north of D.C. for 20 years from like 1995 to 2015, I think it was, or yeah. 2012. I forget the actual date. Um and then I went to work for Edney Flower Balm, which is a balm wholesaler in New Jersey. And then they got bought by Fred Glockner Company, which is a plant broker company. So then I could sell seed and all kinds of other stuff to cut flower growers. And then in 2020, in the middle of the pandemic, um, Ball Seed bought Fred Glockner Company. So then I started working for Ball Seed. And now I can sell uh, bulbs, perennials, woodies, not woodies, I'm sorry, bulbs, perennials, and seed to cut flower growers all across the country. I'm also a lifetime member of the Association of Specialty Cut Flower Growers, which is also known as the ASCFG, and past president, past regional director. I was a conference chair, industry liaison, um, done all kinds of stuff with the ASCFG. And then I also do the online course with the Gardeners Workshop and Lisa here um, called Bulbs, Perennials, Woodies, and More. Thank you, Dave. And you know, I always forget that I'm a lifetime member of the ASCFG too. Brag about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and so we were both on the board at the same time. That was just such a great time. I mean, what a great educational amazing organization. organization. Yeah, five years it's been around. Yeah, yeah. This is the anniversary year. Yeah. I, yeah, that's really awesome. So, um, I'll talk. Just say the first thing that I think of when you're thinking about ways to sell your flowers. I think most people instantly their heads go to farmers market, and that is one of twenty in yes. my mind. Yeah. Um, but I I really recommend to people to kind of do a little little retail research before you start figuring out. Right. I mean, going and visiting a local farmers market, going and visiting some so many florist shops are now a part of a bigger gift shop or a a retail store, right? To go down and do a little recon and see what's going on, right? In your area. Yeah. Look around your area and see also what kind of competition is there. There might be two great farmer's markets in your area, but if each farmer's market has one or two really good flower farmers, your chances of getting into that market is pretty slim. So you, if you want to grow cut flowers in your neighborhood or your area, you're either going to have to go farther away or sell them some other way. It's true. Yeah, there's only room for, you know, one or two cut flower farmers at each farmer's market. Yep. And so, and I I wanted to actually start off with this and I kind of skipped right over it. Um, So I know we hear a lot of chatter about, oh my gosh, there are just too many flower farmers. Um, So let's talk about the facts. So up until this year, because I don't know what the number is for this year, um, for the past two years, the cut flowers sold in the United States alone. We're not talking about 
plants, we're talking about cut flowers, yeah, cut flowers. was like seven to eight billion dollars. That's with a B, y'all. Yes. Um, that's seven to eight billion dollars in cut flowers. And about 80 percent of those flowers are imported. So that means that 80 percent of that business is available to you or me or Dave or whoever figures out how to become a pro and make it so more professional consumers, retail customers, I mean, not customers, commercial customers right. can have access to you, right? Right. And that's forecasted to go up to 12 billion by 2025. So I just wanted to say that out of the gate because we hear a lot of that. There may be too many growers for a farmer's market that you visited, but that is just the tip of the iceberg, right? right? You can do any other, we'll discuss all the other kinds of ways you can sell your flowers in the same area. Just right. different customer base, different way of selling it. And so the other thing I want to say is that you may have to do a little experimenting, right? I mean, I don't know about you, Dave, but I have sold every way possible, just oh, about, with the exception of weddings. I never did an event I like I that. I did weddings. I did Oh my gosh. Whole Foods, farmers markets, farm stand, grocery store, all kinds of stuff. Yeah. But it, it's always going to, your farm is going to evolve. Yes. So if you're not going to start year one, so I'm going to sell, you know, three, these three ways, guarantee in five years, it's going to be three different ways, or maybe there's three plus two other ones. It's going to change just like any, you know, any good restaurant, the menu changes, except for maybe, even McDonald's get new stuff on the menu. You know, you evolve and change with the, every year, you get something different. It's true. And as you develop as a farmer, you find out what is your way of growing. I mean, Dave, I know that you grew into this year round right. in a northern state, y'all. I mean, he was in Maryland. They get freezing cold winters. Um, he grew year round. So that became your niche, right? I mean, uh, that would you would have never forecasted that. But I never dreamed that when I started. It just changed. And one year, the farmer market's going all year. Well, I, I want to sell all year, so let's do it. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So what we're saying, and my sister's nose is probably itching right about now. I mean, I was constantly changing how we were selling. I was always bringing on a new way because one of the things that I think we all underestimate is how many flowers you can grow from a small space. Yes. Always have more flowers than you can sell. That was always my goal. Anyway, I never wanted to sell out and not have flowers right. available. Always. Always plant more and just if you have too many to sell, work a little harder to sell them. Exactly. Yeah. And um, so you needed a lot of avenues is what I'm getting at. So I typically had five different fingers of sales outlets during all those years that I was selling because you had to I had a lot of flowers to sell. So let's talk about some of the different ways that you can sell. So at the top of my list, now Jesse made this list for me. And so it's a great list. And there's someone here that I wouldn't have thought of a roadside stand, which was something I could never have. I'm in the city. The right. ordinances mm -hmm. wouldn't allow it. What do you know about roadside stands? Well, a roadside stand would be one where it's just at the end of your driveway. You set up a little stand and sell your cut flowers. And if you, as long as you have people that drive down your street, it can work. You like Lisa said she can't do it in her neighborhood. It all depends where you're located. And that like in Maryland, if you're a farm, you can put anything you want at the end of your driveway as a farmer to sell your products. There's no restrictions. But some states or cities might be a little bit different. But it's basically having a stand at the end of your driveway, whether it's open seven days a week or just the weekends or just you know Saturday only. Right. Where people know that they consistently come and get flowers from you on a, on a regular basis, which means you don't put flowers out there for a few days and then don't have them for three weeks and put them out again. It's just like, you know, you wouldn't go to a grocery store or a restaurant that's only open occasionally. It's got to be open all the time. Mm -hmm. But I know people, um, Janice Harris up in Canada. Yes. She's stand at the end of her driveway. And I told her, I said, sell the flowers at the end of the driveway, keep that money separate, and you can pay to go to the conference. Well, she and her husband and all three kids came to the conference in North Carolina and had a week's vacation, too. I know her end of the driveway stand has gotten so busy, they built a building for it. No more cart or wagon. They built a building and have an employee out there now because it's so busy at the end of her driveway up in the middle of nowhere, Canada, that she it's can sell all flowers. It's yeah. true. The things I think of when I think of a farm stand is right. You have to have some traffic to be able right. to sustain it. She, like me, she lives like on the edge of, the I edge think, of a, of a developed yeah, area, yeah. a perfect, perfect spot. Yeah. But the other things to consider is you got to have a place for people to park to be able to do that and to get on and off the highway safely. And I say right. that because on my way to the beach years ago, when we used to go to beach 
um, before I was married, you'd go down there for a week, you know, down to Nags Head. There was this farm stand on the way down there, but it was like risk your life to pull in or pull in out. and out of that thing. Yep. So that's just a consideration. So a roadside stand for circumstances, once you're set up to do it and you know what you're doing, that is an awesome way to sell. And the other thing with a place like a roadside stand, you can sell anything. If you only have three sunflowers blooming this week, you can still sell them. Just put them in a bouquet. Yeah. You know, it, it's not like a florist always wants to buy a bunch of 10 or, you know, five bunches of 10. At a roadside stand, you can sell any quantity that you have. You have more flexibility. Very flexible. Yes. Yeah, that's true. So farmer's markets. So there's farmer's markets and then there's farmer's markets, right? I mean, there's established high volume farmer's markets, which we have boned. Dave, Dave was part of the DuPont farmer's market in Washington, D.C. Right. And I was part of the Williamsburg farmer's market in Colonial Williamsburg, which is another rocking market. Um, so let's talk about busy markets first. Yeah. When you get a busy market, it's like amazing. You know, it's like the difference between having a you know, just a huge store where, you know, thousands of customers walking by versus 750 customers walk by. Um, the DuPont Circle Market would have five, six, seven thousand 7,000 people walk by the market, you know, come to the market that day, which is insane number. Um, but having that many people come to the market, you got to have the product for it. So you never want to go to a big market like that and run out of flowers in the first half hour or 45 minutes right. or so, because then you're losing, you know, 80% of your potential sales and you're going to just lose business. You're not going to be able to grow. So you want to make sure you have enough product when you go to a farmer's market. Um, I've always said, somebody always said, abundance sells. So yep. if you go to the grocery store, there's a whole big pile of oranges. They probably never sell all those oranges, but they sell a lot more oranges because they have a lot of them there. It's the same way with flowers. If you have a one little table with three little bouquets, you're not going to sell them. If you have a big table with 30 bouquets, you're probably going to sell 28 or 29 of those bouquets. It's true. You know, the person that um, when I left the farmer's market a um, long time ago, the the next farmer that came in who didn't even last the whole season was making little teeny tussy mussies or something they right, call yeah. them, which I have nothing, no problem with tussy mussies. But when you were walking past the booth, you look right and see Amy's garden, who is still at the Williamsburg Farmer's Market and does a banging business. She's got buckets and buckets and buckets of yeah. sunflowers and coxcomb. And then you look to the left and you see this dainty little pretty booth. Well, people look, oh, isn't that cute? And they don't even go over there. Exactly. So yeah. it is about the visuals. And, you know, I tell people, you know, Dave and I are huge proponents of planting sunflowers every week. Even if you don't think you can sell them, use them for exactly. display at the farmer's yeah. market. Because right? people stop and look, yep. Um, you got to pull people in. So that's all we could talk about farmers markets for the rest of this time, but we're not going to do that. Okay. Um, so another one that I found not to be so successful for me is Jesse has listed here fairs, festivals, and community events. I don't know about you, Dave, but when people go to those kinds of events, they don't tend to buy flowers. They're look, they're walking around eating and visiting right. and they don't, their flowers are going to wilt before they can get them to where they're going. And even if you provide a way to hold them, people aren't thinking about that at those, in my experience, when I've done those things, what right. about if, you? Get? If they're going to a community event, whether it's like, you know, the town fair or something like that, they're not usually expecting to find flowers there. So you might get a few people who are really into flowers who will buy them, right. but you're not going to have a, any huge amount of sales. Um, it can be some way to kind of advertise for your right. the market you're at or your farm stand at home. But I would never expect a place like that to be a really big right. busy market unless I, I used to go to one that was a Christmas market. And yes. that was different because people came there buying gifts and I would sell amaryllis and paper white plants, things like that. Yes. It did really well. But it all depends, you know, what the purpose of the market, if people are going there for food and music, they're not going to buy flowers. So Well, and, you know, you might, you, maybe we just have to look at it differently too. It's like, this is a marketing opportunity. Marketing, you can put yes. up a big sign that says, Kids only free flowers and have to give them each two or three marigolds or sunflowers that aren't going to wilt horribly, right. but that's going to cause a buzz, right? I mean, exactly. Yep. I always said, go back to the farmers, like always give little kids flowers because then their parents always feel guilty and they buy flowers. <laughs> it's true. It's true. So now, Dave, this is after our time um, on having an online store, whether yes. that's Etsy or through social media your own website or through rooted farmers, even selling online is a huge 
way to sell flowers now. Yes. Right? I know somebody in uh, Massachusetts who has a huge CSA, which we're going to talk about that later, about case subscription. Yes. But she also will sometimes just have an open farm, pick your own for the day and, and sell tickets. You have to buy online, then come and pick up the flowers and harvest yourself. And she'll sell a couple thousand dollars for the bouquets for that week and pick your own. You know, she has got a really big following on social media, which if you're going to do that, you have to have a big following. Yeah. And you have to post often. You can't just post every six weeks or so. you got to be active and post at least once a week, sometimes twice a week. But having that following allows you to say, hey, we have an excess of whatever it is this week, sunflower special, dahlias, whatever you have. And, you know, pick them up the farm. They're, you know, two bunches for the price of one or three for the price of two. Something special, right? Something special to get people out to your farm. Well, and I think people are also looking for that experience. But oh, yes. So I remember that this really was developed or really was cultivated during the pandemic when we all had to figure out contactless <clears throat> sales, right. Right? right? Yep. So there is no end to that. I mean, I know people that only sell their flowers through social media, mm -hmm. people that, you know, have built their following, really tell their story on social media. And they don't even have to do anything but post that and they do it all online. So that's pretty awesome. So CSAs. The CSA was the same as the bouquet subscription. <laughs> that's, right. That's where people prepay for whether it's the entire season or sometimes a, 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 um, for the whole year or a season. Like I, I know somebody does a tulip CSA. Then they do a dahlia right. CSA. So right. you're, all you're going to get is tulips over those three or four weeks in the spring. And <laughs> You pre-sell them, so people usually buy those in December or January. It's a great thing to market as a holiday Christmas type gift yes. to buy for your neighbor, your mother, or whatever. Um, but they're pre-sold, so you might got to make sure you better have those flowers when it's time to, to deliver. So CSAs, so what you just described is kind of, we called it our bouquet subscription right, is exactly, all we yeah. call that. And yeah, we did it in weeks and pre-selling those puppies Oh my gosh, that was just a great part of business. They were like right off the top of our harvest and you knew those were sold. And that was a great influx of cash in the off season, right? Pay for your bulbs or seeds or whatever else. Um, but the thing is, like I said, you got to make sure you deliver. Because even though yeah. it's technically a farm share, well, the farm was terrible this year, but people don't usually understand that if they gave you $300 in January, they still want something for the, their flowers for the summer. Yeah, and you know, back when I first kind of started my bouquet subscription, which was really based, I learned about it from reading Elliot Coleman's book about his share. A big part back then, when this all originated, was really telling people the story. This is called you investing with your farmer. Right. You taking part of the risk. But that's not part of the marketing nowadays. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? People are like, you're guaranteed flowers. Um, so there's a lot of wiggle room in that. But you know what? Frankly, Dave, we grew so many flowers. We could have done 30 more bouquets every right. week with no sweat. You know, right. I mean, so I think that is our business bouquet subscription was how that all started. And that was just so great for businesses. It was first of the week, Monday mornings or Monday afternoons, actually. I would walk in and hand them their bouquet and they were responsible for putting it in the vase. And right. um, it was awesome. That was and great. Businesses, what kind of businesses were you selling to? Oh, lawyers, CPAs. We have, it was like a business professional park. Okay. And so I went there like this year, I would go in like, especially this time of the year, maybe like in August when it's slow, you know, when you take that little dip, make up a bunch of bouquets, just like the same size that you would be delivering and wrap them, you know, slop, drop them in a craft sleeve with the card in there and say limited time subscriptions for the 2024 season available and even have the prices back there. We bring it to your door every Monday. Right. And, you know, I mean, you just want to be sure the receptionist can read right. all of them right. because they're the ones that are going to hit it home to their bosses. Yeah. We delivered seven bouquets to one office wow. for, four, for four years. Oh, my gosh. For yeah. 20 weeks. It adds that was up. like Very a fast. huge. Yeah. And so I said, OK, you only pay for six. I'll throw in the seventh one for free. <laughs> you know, I mean, that was just huge. And they're girls it was a um they were the kind of people that match a professional person with people looking for the job you know oh, I think it was business. yeah and 
So their girls love that. And so, yeah, there's no end to the bouquet subscription, oh, right. CSA, whatever you call it. Yeah, I know They're, somebody, Ellen Frost does it with a restaurant. They get flowers every week and instead of paying them, yes. they give them gift cards. So they can go there to eat or give the gift cards as gifts, gifts to their employees. I mean, there really is no end. And so another one is, and, you know, Jenny Love does a, has a um, workshop that we have on the Gardener's Workshop called, um, what is it called? Is it called Workshops for You or Workshops for Me? I, and I should have looked that Something up. With workshops, right. <laughs> um, and it's all about how to host, run, lead a professional workshop, whether on your farm or even in a destination and you right. provide you flowers. Right. That is a huge outlet for a volume of flowers. And it's amazing how much people will pay for that. We're not talking $20 a person. We're talking oh, $150 right. a person. Right. And because I'm, people, I'm looking as we're yeah. talking about this because now I'm annoyed with myself that I don't know. That really good. If you have the right location on your farm, the right building to do it in or to go somewhere else and do it. Whether it's yes. a local community center or, you know. Making workshops work for you. It right. came to me. I couldn't, I didn't find it. <laughs> and she even, I mean, that is really a great workshop. That's an on-demand class. But Jenny will tell you, that is the highest profit flowers that she sells right behind high dollar weddings. And it's a whole lot less work yeah. because people come for the experience. Um, and she also talks about in the course that you don't have to like be some big flower arranger. No. He no. takes you through how somebody like me, you can create this experience for people on your farm to cut or not cut. I don't know what they do on her. I think she does them both ways. It is just a great way to move flowers and to create a whole nother level of an experience. Yeah. So floral workshops or classes would be at the top of my list, right? So, and then we've, I think we've already talked about this corporate sales to local businesses, restaurants, offices, salons, shops, hotels, B and B real estate agents for home staging. And you know what I was embarking on as I ended my sales um, when we stopped produ producing for sales is we have a boatload of cruise ships that dock in Norfolk, Virginia. Right. I mean, that, that would be like, you know, I served Colonial Williamsburg for 15 years. These are places that make and maintain flower arrangements. There is no better market for local flowers because our flowers last so long. Last longer, right. Yeah. right. So that's a really, I mean, there in, there's no end. So, and then, which, you know, was my main meat and potatoes, florists and designers, right? Yeah. The florists are going to need flowers every week. Yep. Sometimes you have a designer that doesn't have events every week, but when they do have events, they can be really big events where they, they don't want just 20 dahlias or 20, whatever you have. They want 200. Yeah. So you have the volume for it, but they can be really good where they'll be buying two or $3,000 worth of flowers mm -hmm. in one, one delivery. Yeah. And, you know, my kind of target market was to sell staple flowers to florists. Right. You know, I wanted that thousand dollar a week stand in order of uh, this, the flowers they use every day of their business right. life. So there the is. With, I would say the trick with retail florists is to get them to buy flowers from you, not for weddings and events, but just to have them in the cooler for the orders that they know they're going to have that week, whether it's sunflowers, lusianthus, agiratum, yeah. lilies, that they buy them from you, not knowing where they're going to use them yet, but they know that they're going to need them. So they buy them from you. Right. And, you know, and I'm sure that some of our flowers went to event, weddings and events, yeah. but that's not what I grew for. As, as I often say when I'm talking about this is I never wanted to see a color swatch of fabric. Right. <laughs> yes. Don't even be bringing swatches around me. You know, yeah. that was never my calling or my focus. Yeah. Um, and so <laughs> our florist just loved having dependable quality and consistency. And so the, the designers... I did take care of a few event people, but not on a regular basis. They would be the ones to call up in July and say, I need 800 stems of pink anything. Well, I right. can normally hook them up with a bunch of pink zinnias right. in the middle of the summer, you know, but I didn't build my business around them because guess what? All the other weeks, they weren't there. Right. Yeah, you it's know? a good fill in, but it's not something 
you can rely on unless you've got you know, 10 different designers and then some right. of them every week for an event. I mean, you kind of have to focus your business, right? I mean, if you're mm-hmm. going to do those blushes and pinks and take care of a bunch of different event people, that could work great for you. But right. that was just not mine. And that is an opportunity. And then, you know, it's the farmer florist opportunity. Those There's a couple of different ways to do that. I mean, it's like, um, I think what Jenny, another course that Jenny teaches is... Um, Farmer Florist School, the wedding process. And that is not about flower arranging, y'all. It is the business, the business of end. doing flowers for, for weddings and Proposals events, and not just weddings. And, right. Um, and the the most, I mean, I sat outside the door listening. She recorded her course here just like you did. And so I was sitting outside the, the office door on the landing, listening to part of it. And what an eye-opening experience. She actually tells you the things that you perhaps shouldn't grow, that you should be buying from another farmer, um, and what the 10 crops to grow. Um, And the business of farmer floristing is the way to make money. I mean, that is the highest dollar per stem that you can get for your flowers. She also goes down how you handle client, how you find your client. Right. Are you cut out for this? How to hire designers if you're not a designer? I mean, freelancers. It's such a great opportunity if, but you have to have the nerves of steel to do it because there's just always lots of last minute, intense things. Um, anyway, farmer florist doing, growing, and selling your flowers to some way that does the events is one de- way to do it. But doing the events yourself, holy cow! opportunity but that's a lot she'll tell you she does crop planning dave i didn't realize that until she did this course um so i mean when she meets with you and finds out your colors and i mean it becomes part of her crop plan and literally the flowers are grown for your event right and if you're growing flowers for an event you got to grow more to get ready the week before and the week after yep, exactly it's not going to help <laughs> Um, and so that is where the highest dollars are, but they're everything that go the, I mean, the bigger the reward, the bigger the risk is, right? Um, but that's definitely, there are people out there that are obviously doing it and doing it very, very successfully. Um, and then I would say the last one is, and I never did this. I tried once, but I never went through with it, was selling to a wholesaler. Did you do that? I never sold to a wholesaler. Um, to me, to sell to wholesale, you need to have a, a big volume of each flower. They don't want five bunches or 10 bunches. They want 20 or 30 or 50 bunches of each flower you're growing. They're going to usually pay the least, lowest amount, right. but you can sell a whole truckload of flowers to them. So one delivery and you're done. I know several growers who do only wholesale sales, but it's a different way of doing it. And like I said, it's all on high volume, slightly lower, sometimes a, a bit lower price, but it's all in volume. Yeah. And it eliminates a lot of the process if that's what you're doing. You know, I, you know, one of the very first conferences I ever went to, it was not an ASCFG. It was actually down here at one of the universities. And I don't remember who they were. The couple that gave a program, I can remember they had a lot of small children and they had a big farm. And I can remember, you know, people asking him questions. They grew like 20 hundred foot beds of Larkspur. And he said, The wholesaler comes to our farm once a week and picks up everything that we sell. Yes, I make less money, but I don't have to have a vehicle that has to have insurance, the time to do it, the driver. And that worked really well for them. And it seems to me that I heard in the following years at that same Virginia State University conference that that evolved. As their kids got bigger, guess what? They were able to go out and do markets or to sell to florists right. directly. So, you know, selling to wholesalers may not, yes, you get less money, but when you really do it and focus your business on right. that, you have a lot less expenses. Yeah. But the only other thing I would point out with selling to wholesalers is make sure they're committed to buying it for you. If you plan it yeah. expecting to sell to them, they better buy it. Because yeah. you don't want 5,000 sunflowers ready next week and they said, oh, we don't need them. So right. there's going to be a relationship there where they're going to support you and you're going to support them. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, there's just so many opportunities, Dave, As and I could just keep on talking about them, but we're going to stop here. Um, I hope this has just wet the taste buds of people. And 
you know, I know that you, like me, we had a lot of different avenues because when you're growing high production, you have a lot of flowers every of flowers. week, yes. week after week after week, right? And you have and, to sell them if you want to stay in business. You can't just exactly. <laughs> and, you know, for us, it's like if it was a rainy week at the farmer's market, thank goodness Awful. we had supermarkets. <laughs> we didn't talk yes. about supermarkets. We no, have to talk so about that's not on there, right? Um, supermarkets are great. Again, it's you get yes. a lower price, but I used to sell to Whole Foods and I could take them in mixed bouquets and anything in them. It didn't matter. If right. they were pink that week, they were, they were pink. Maybe next week they were yellow, but they would take any mixed bouquets, whatever was in it. And you know what really worked out for us? So we did farmer's markets for 14 years. And then in the 14th year is, well, actually in the 13th year, Pamela Arnowski cornered me in Oklahoma and told me about sushi. She says, you've got to sell to supermarkets, Lisa. You've got to, you're in the city, you know, they're all around. Yeah. Right. And so that, so I went home and connected with a farm, with a supermarket a chain and started selling to them. Well, I was too terrified to give up farmer's markets. It's yeah. like for one year we sold at the farmer's markets that we were doing, which was three and we sold to supermarkets. My sister almost divorced me that year. <laughs> um, but I was afraid to give them up because I knew I would never get back into those markets. Yeah, if you leave and, a market, it's hard to get back. And what you figure out really quickly is that supermarkets, even though we were selling those mixed bouquets at wholesale, we made those bouquets in this building in air conditioning. They were sold before we made them. All we had to do was make them and dump them off. Right. And it was every single week. It was a standing order. Unlike going to the farmer's market, putting up two tents, dragging 30 buckets of flowers. And then if it's a rainy or a hot day, there's no traffic or right. less traffic. Sales will drop, right. So it's all about what you focus on. We sold to two supermarket chains um, and sold to about six stores at each one of those chains. And the chains were real close to each other. So it really worked out really, really easily. So again, it's, you know, what are you set up for and what do you want to do? You know, I haven't put a tent up since those days. <laughs> you don't you know? miss it, do you? <laughs> Not at all. Um, so there's a lot of opportunities to sell flowers. You just have to find them. If you're going to sell commercially, you have to find a easy, professional, convenient way for your customers to buy. And that's the that's the secret. Right. Um, oh, I thought that real quick, the other secret is you have to have the best flowers. Out exactly. There. Quality, that's for all of them. You can lose your business. So quality's got to be there and you can sell in any any method or any channel you want to, to pursue as yeah. long as you have good quality. And Dave, can we just go down this rabbit hole for just a minute? Sure. Are you like me seeing how many old flowers are being shown on social media? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I'm so sad. It's like people have to learn. They have to understand there is a lot of different pieces to being a flower farmer. And each one of them seems the most important to you at any one given time. And I totally believe that people use their own eyes to decide the stage to harvest. And that, in fact, is not right. the right way right. to do so it. When you see a, a, a bed of sunflowers that are all open, it's like, no, you're three days late. <laughs> and or they should not be open in the buckets. Right. At, I mean, exactly. maybe. You're right. So for us, we I mean, we only harvest twice a week, you know, Mondays and Thursdays. So sunflowers. I used to think, oh, we're going to harvest them every day. Well, there's just too much other stuff that needs to be done. So the way that worked out for us is we cut on Monday, cut super hard. On by Thursday, yes, there's some open sunflowers or whatever flower we're talking about that continues to develop after you cut it. So you always cut it tight, right? Mm -hmm. So it is nice when you're making a mixed bouquet to have one open sunflower with three others that aren't open yet. Right. But to see buckets of flowers flame open sunflowers or two um, um, snapdragons that are fully Boom engorged or right. larkspur. I mean, I think that we, our industry just, we're doing a great job, but we've got a long way to go. Yeah. Um, and it just really hurts the whole industry. Um, and the cut flower book, the ASCFG's post harvest mm -hmm. handling book 
is not easy reading y'all, but you need to go in there and read it right. by the flower for what you're getting ready to cut. Yeah, because stage of harvest is really important. Like you said, you can't pick a sunflower two days late. You can't pick a snapdragon that's bloomed all the way to the top. It's just not going to last for the customer. And it ruins them for the rest of us. Right. Um, if, you, if somebody buys flowers that turn out to be not good, that only last a few days, they may never tell you and they may never buy flowers from you and they may never buy flowers from anybody again. Yeah. So quality has got to be good. Yeah. And particularly if you're trying to get into the commercial, I think because I'm such a stinking rule follower and I read the rule, what is the stage to harvest? All right. I mean, well, I'll drop an, a flower that I think by the time that gets to my florist, that flower is going to be, you know, on its way down the hill. And that's not what we're all about. And, um, you know, I always did really well in that market because I knew the stage to harvest and it's really hard. And wow. so I just wanted to send that flame up. We've, we've got work to do and, and encourage people. If you are having trouble, there is solutions to the problems. Yeah. All right, Dave, as always, thank you so much for joining us here and, um, love chit chatting with you. Always good to visit with you. All right, friends, until we meet again, um, check out all those mentioned courses that we talked about. And I mean, just anything that we've mentioned, you can usually find a path to it over at thegardenersworkshop.com. And until we meet again, friends, ciao. Bye-bye.